here on ESPN. So glad to have you with us here tonight at Cameron Indoor Stadium in Durham, North Carolina. My cousins, former Virginia and NBA guard Corey Alexander as well. Well, Duke, Corey has won early, and they've won often with sharp defense and efficient scoring. And this Duke team is actually going as a throwback to when Mike Krzyzewski started coaching at Duke and getting into passing lanes, using steals to get out in transition, and that's been huge for them. They're third in Division I, averaging 27 transition points per game, and it just fuels this young group, especially when you see the spectacular highlight dunks from Zion Williamson and R.J. Barrett. And Mitch Henderson, his eighth year, loves this Tigers team because of what they've added with Jalen Llewellyn. And Jalen Llewellyn missed the first seven games of the season due to injury and illness, but has been great since he's returned. 19 and a half points per game. And Mitch Henderson feels like he has his true leader as a freshman. Plays well beyond his years in the backcourt. Only two games in, but he loves his freshman point guard. He's got some exceptional bounce. They're happy to have him back. And the Tigers staring down history Duke has not lost a home non-conference game since February of 2000 against St. John's. There have been a couple teams that have played him to a one-point margin, and Princeton will hope to be the enders of that streak here tonight. The Tigers 5-4, and four, the Blue Devils number two in the country, 9-1, and one, and they win the opening tip. It goes to Javin Deloria, who gets his second straight start. Just the seventh of the junior's career. Pull up from Barrett's around and out. Williamson has the rebound, sends it to the corner, and a three from Cam Reddish is off the mark. He's just one for his last 15. But three straight offensive rebounds for Duke on the first possession. And an offensive foul charged to Williamson that draws the early ire of the Cameron faithful. And that's one of the areas when you see Zion Williamson along the baseline, and he's had issues throughout the early part of this season, staying on the court in the first half and not getting in foul trouble. Not sure how much of that was on Zion, other than the fact that he's just big and strong and knocks people over because it doesn't seem like he really had much choice there. When there's pins in the way, what's a bowling ball supposed to do? <laughs> and the violation called on Richmond Ariri Guzzo, the junior played his high school basketball in Ewing, New Jersey for the Tigers. Trey Jones, Cam Reddish, R.J. Barrett, Zion Williamson, the four freshmen starting for Duke as they have every game, along with Delorier, who's in the last couple games replaced Marquise Bolden in the starting five. Foul is on Barrett. Coming down the floor, so one on him and one on Williamson. And, you know, it's, it's a small thing, but if you're Princeton, you really like your start for Coach Henderson who is excited about bringing his team here into Cameron Indoor, talking about being able to play in the historic venues throughout the country. You know, but it's a great start for them. They all, other than the giving up the offensive rebounds, they've been able to hold Duke scoreless. And you have a foul on R.J. Barrett and Zion Williamson early in this game, and you take a 1-0 lead. At the end of the day, many teams never get a chance to come in here and lead. You'll take 1-0 when you have the opportunity. Last we were here, we saw Stetson. Have a, I believe it was a 12-11 lead, and then the Blue Devils went on something in the neighborhood of a 40 to single-digit point run. So the game can flip in the blink of an eye for the opposition. It really can, but you want to stay aggressive. And what we're seeing right now out of, out of Princeton is somewhat of a 1-3-1 zone, but it looks like man-to-man. -man. We talked to Coach K before the game and asked him if he was expecting much zone from this team. He said they're a man team, so he'd be surprised if he saw a lot of them. Well, they've played zone on 20% of their possessions this year, most among any of the eight Ivy League teams. And Mitch Henderson said, expect to mix it in, although Coach K in watching the last couple games, of, he watched them all, of course, but most recently their last two games, said he didn't see a lot of zone. And one thing that you're going to see from any Princeton offense is the back door, which could be very valuable against this Duke pressure defense, but I'm sure... Coach K has fooled his team on seeing that and making sure they're recovering throughout the possession. Llewellyn feeds inside and traveling the call against Ariri Guzzo. Ten-day layoff for Coach K and the Blue Devils. The word he used for it, grueling. So it's such a long wait. You have the freshmen, especially with writing heavy classes here early in their collegiate careers. Although for some, it may be late in their collegiate careers. Who knows? but he's certainly happy to get back on the floor. What he's concerned about, conditioning. Well, and he, he told us that he felt like his guys thought they could do more than they actually could do, but they had opportunity to scrimmage and practice and get up and down and try to shake off the rust as we see the backdoor cut 
Again, a staple of the Princeton offense, which this Princeton offense is not the same as you saw Pete Carrill use back in the day where you were scoring in the 40s and 50s, but still the same principles rely in using that aggressiveness of Duke's defenders to get easy, rim, easy opportunities at the rim. Barrett hits the deck as it gets volleyballed away. And the Tigers having a chance for a fast break, slow it down, leave it in the hands of the freshman Llewellyn. They've turned it over quite a bit this year, but that was with Llewellyn not on the floor. Having him back, they hope to reverse that trend. And Morales finding Stevens on the back cut right there. You see a very nice play, and Duke's defense aggressively will be out in passing lanes, trying to push Princeton's offense out towards half court, leaving the middle of the floor open. Duke leads the country and block shots, but when there's no one there to block it, of course, you negate that. DeLaurier denies at the rim. Ariri Guzzo gets the rebound, sends it out, and a long-range three is off the mark from Devin Kennedy, a 50% three-point shooter. Blue Devils so far 0 for 6 from the floor. Jones gives it a try, and off back iron. So a cold start for Duke more than three minutes in and a zero on the board. And you mentioned that layoff, and this is what happens when you go that long of a stretch without being able to play a game against other competition. Practice is completely different, but you can never simulate game action in practice. And Jalen Llewellyn finds his way to the rim for his first bucket here at Camden Indoor. Here's Barrett for three. And one of the other things that Prince has done a very good job of is cutting off the driving lanes for R.J. Barrett, Zion Williamson, Cam Reddish. All of these guys have really had to settle for everything along the perimeter thus far in this game. Stevens gets another reverse lay in. His second going from left to right. He's now got six of their eight. Hey, Mike, you remember when I mentioned the back door early in this telecast? At this point, I may actually sound like I know what I'm talking about, huh? Well, there's a first time for everything. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank for you. It. Thank you for acknowledging <laughs> that first time. Here comes Barrett. If long distance doesn't work, close range gets the job done. Princeton 5-4 and four to start the year. Last year, a trying season for the team from the Garden State. 13-16 and 16 and 5-9 and nine in conference play. But it's been a good tenure for Mitch Henderson. Now in his eighth year, has averaged 19 wins a season over the last five. Shot clock is dwindling here, just four to shoot. Morales on the move, gets turned away by Delorier and Reddish. Jones on the break, has options. Zion rejected, and Delorier fades and scores. Llewellyn at the point, first spotted by the Princeton staff when he came to their camp as a sophomore. He's got his eyes up and finds a Riri Guzzo hanging out under the basket. Barrett, and it's a blocking foul called by Ted Valentine. The Tigers have come to North Carolina ready to play. And Jalen Llewellyn bringing his game on the road. Not only with his playmaking at the rim, averaging close to 20 points per game, but also dropping dimes. The back door has given Princeton an early lead. 6'9", 6'10". It's a little taller, a little <laughs> taller. No shots yet for Zion Williamson. As Duke trails Princeton 10-4 here in the early going, R.J. Barrett, his freshman running mate, just one for six to start. And we have seen the rust. We talked about the 10-day layoff. You've seen rust on this Duke team. Coach K, talk to us about the, the three very good solid practices that they had coming into this game. But yet, it's so difficult to simulate that game action, especially when you get the nerves of the crowd in the stands and everyone cheering you on. A sudden, a couple of the shots were rushed early for the Blue Devils, but now as they settle in, we'll see, I'm sure, more of what we've seen from Duke all season long after the first time out. And a different lineup for both squads as well. Ryan Schwieger and Jerome DeRosier into the game for Princeton. Marquise Bolden onto the floor for Duke. With Jack White and Alex O'Connell as well. 
Schwiegers three drops through. But another opportunity created by the transition. And one thing Coach Henderson has done, he got Morales into the game early, and now you have the two point guards on the floor handling the pressure from Duke, forcing R.J. Barrett really to have to guard a point guard, and which is not his strength. And he just bullied his way through Luella, and he's got five now. That is his strength. Offense, <laughs> anything on the offensive end of the floor is his strength. And he's a good defender. I don't take that away from him, but yet he's used to guarding guys off the basketball, not having to guard guys at the top of the key. And that's what helps, as we talked about right at the beginning of the show tonight, is getting those steals on lazy passes and quickly taking them the other way. Jones with a kick for O'Connell, a step back on the three. White missed time the jump. Here's Jones. Right now, Duke, in my opinion, has done, you know, has really helped Princeton by shooting so many threes and living on the perimeter in comparison to getting the ball in the paint where their advantage is. And they're 0 for 7 from 3. But this is where they thrive in transition. A near turnover. There's White, one of the co-captains to salvage it. Nice reach in there to take it away. Kennedy, the senior, it's the third Duke turnover. And that's a problem. When the seven-footer's trying to post up a six-foot guard and you can't get the ball to him, that's a problem on the passer as well as the big guy trying to hold off a smaller player behind him. Kennedy, former high school football star in the South Bend area, comes up empty. Duke down by six as they work with the ball here. Team that has won it by wide margins, leading the country in scoring margin, winning by about 27 points a game. Just look at what they've done in the month of December, won by an average score of 96 to 54. You see, I got a little bit of a problem. O'Connell, no, Barrett with the follow, and there's a foul on the loose ball. So I, I've I'm got surprised a surprise we've been able to narrow this down to one. Yeah, just, just, just one Let problem. Okay, so on the previous possession, R.J. Barrett goes to the basket. He goes in, he doesn't score, he gets knocked down, he falls, you know, into our camera. Well, Jalen Llewellyn happens to fall on top of him, but Jalen gets up first, and instead of sprinting to the offensive end of the floor, he helps R.J. up. Now, see, let me tell you why I have a problem with this, okay? You see R.J. go down, there goes Jalen, all right? Jalen gets up. Now, this is when you push him down and run back. <laughs> and the only reason he can get away from that is these two guys are boys. That's his boy. See, now, if it was just an opposing team, an opposing, you know, guy is one thing. But when that's your boy, you push him down and you run back down the floor and make sure you have a 5 on 4 These two guys go way back, of course, both from Canada, both playing on the Canadian national team. And but that one right there, perfect opportunity for, for Llewellyn to be able to create advantage basketball. Five on four if he would just push R.J. down and sprint it down the floor. I know you, you know their hometowns. Do you want to pronounce it? No, that's your job. Mississauga, Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's why it's your job. Kennedy has it stolen. Williamson goes one on two. The lefty lay-in is good, and it's a two-point game. And that's where the live ball turnovers help Duke because you have so many guys on the floor that can that can create their offense in transition Zion Williamson who pretty much plays the four spot but yet he gets the ball in a, off a live ball turnover rebound he can still push the basketball and make plays individually in the open court almost from half court well wide from Kennedy Duke has a chance to tie or take the lead here. Ball out of bounds, back to Princeton. Talked about the Canadian connection. Jalen Llewellyn, R.J. Barrett. Why are they so friendly? Push him down, Jalen, push him down. Don't let him up. We'll tell you more about that when we come back. Basketball and the godfather to R.J. Barrett. Unfortunately for Princeton, They've got Llewellyn with two fouls right now, so he's on the bench. Drew Freiburg, the freshman from State College, Pennsylvania, who hit three threes last game against Iona, has come in, number five in black. 
From the near wing, it's Miles Stevens shooting just 18% from three coming into the game. He's got nine. And Stevens is having a great showing thus far in this game, and he's one of the guys that Coach Henderson will rely upon all year, one of the veterans who has continued his stellar play from a season ago. White tries his hand and knocks it down. I believe that Jack White has probably been the biggest surprise for this Duke team thus far. You know, everyone that talks basketball knew about the freshmen and how important of an impact they would have, but Jack White is the unsung guy, in my opinion, thus far and early in the season for Duke. Not a good shot there for Reddish, who's just one for his last wait, wait, 16 wait, wait. from three. Why was that not a good shot? Because it was almost at half court. He can shoot from there. You've seen Devin Kennedy shoot two of them from almost half court already. Cam Reddish is more than capable of knocking down the three. He's second in the ACC right now, made three-point shot. When you get an opportunity for a guy that can shoot it that way. Here's the double standard. It's a good shot if it goes in. There you go. It's always <laughs> a good shot if it goes in. Spoken like a true three-point shooter. Past the midway mark of the first half. Tigers still up by two. They've lost two of three. Their most recent game, though, a win against Iona in Atlantic City, New Jersey, 85-81. The two before that were close. They lost to St. John's by five and St. Joe's by ten. Five to shoot. Fade away for Stevens. For the record, it was a good shot. He had was, to shoot it. That was not a good he shot. He had to shoot it. It was a good <laughs> shot. Okay. It was the best shot on a bad possession. Correct. But give Duke's defense <laughs> credit. If you can see the opportunity, they have pushed Princeton's offense so far out, which has opened up the backdoor opportunities, but their offense is so far out towards half court that it's hard to get any action going. And now we see Princeton coming back and going to the zone defense when Llewellyn comes back into the game to try to protect him from foul trouble. Coach K told us in his office before the game, two of the guys best on this team at flashing into the high post, Barrett and Williamson. Zion Williamson now just three or two for 15 from three. Now you see the point guard, Trey Jones, flying in there. I thought Trey was going for the tip dunk right there. The crowd, the crazies were ready to erupt over there. We've seen dunks, of course, all season long from this Duke team that was on the record to break the dunks record, but on pace to break the dunks record, but I don't think we've seen any from Trey yet. No, well, he's excited this time of year, holiday season. We'll see his family. And Duke heads to Madison Square Garden on Thursday to take on Texas Tech. Reddish quickly for an open Barrett. Out of bounds, Duke ball. And Mike, if there is an Achilles heel to this Duke team, we're seeing it right now. Their inability to shoot the ball from three at times. And right now, you know, they're averaging over eight threes a game, but only one for 11 early in this one. So when you talk about how do you beat Duke, you have to pretty much make them play from the perimeter and hope that they don't make shots because when they get in the paint and tack the way that they do that's when they're extremely dangerous shooting under 25 percent prior to that basket from barrett backdoor feed you had a lot of eyes off the basketball there with freiberg getting to the rim and that is beautiful princeton offense zion williamson had his back turned not even recognizing that there was an opponent behind him was able to easily lay it up here's reddish with another try great defensive stand from the tigers two turnaways by a Ririguzo and stevens the former iv defensive player of the year coming up with the takeaway williamson holding his nose at the end of the play 736 here in the first half as the Blue Devils still look for their first lead with Williamson headed to the bench old trap two by athletic trainer Jose Fonseca along the bench after catching an elbow coming down for a rebound last time down the floor a collision with number 12 in black miles stevens watch his right arm there well that's not a collision that's incidental contact design just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and take the brunt of that and that's one where you're always checking your teeth to make sure they're all still there and i believe that the blood was caused from the tooth going through the bottom lip so that's one where you got some pain over there from zion but to be completely honest, at this point, I would have already shed tears. So that just shows you another level of his toughness because he hasn't cried yet. And I say yet because, you know, it's hard to sleep with that at night. Oh, <laughs> hope to see him back on the floor momentarily. 
Seventh turnover for the Blue Devils. Something that certainly has drawn the ire of Coach Mike Krzyzewski. We saw him just a couple timeouts ago. Very intense with his squad, which is in direct contrast to the way he was before the game. Quite relaxed, very optimistic about where his team is right now. Well, he was happy to be back in this environment where they could play a game. You talked about that 10-day layoff, and again, where, where the student athletes have to take exams and they have a very busy schedule. For coaches, it's a lot of downtime. So for Coach K, he really wanted to get back on the court. Mitch Henderson, Princeton's head coach, rolling the dice a little bit here with Llewellyn, who brings the ball up, playing with two fouls, but they need him. He's played so well, averaging almost 20 points a game in the two games since he's returned from injury that kept him out for their first seven. Well, he's talked about, you know, how mature he is for a freshman and how he seems to pretty much just be beyond the age. Also called Jaden Llewellyn the biggest recruiting win that they've had at Princeton. Now, I'm not sure if that's during his tenure as the head coach at Princeton or in general, but he made a, a big statement with that one as Cam Reddish makes a huge statement knocking down the three at the top of the key. And the Blue Devils, who'd only tied it once, lead for the first time tonight. Wellen draws the double team from Freiburg in the corner to Kennedy in the paint who turns it over. White's got a four on two. Down the lane and a blocking foul. Well, after a long layoff, it's two games in three days for the Blue Devils, and we've got their next game Thursday for you right here on ESPN2, 7 Eastern at Madison Square Garden, number 12, Texas Tech and Duke. First time these schools have squared off. You see it on ESPN2, anywhere you go on the ESPN app. And Mike, we asked Coach K if he felt like, you know, there would be any looking ahead from his team, knowing they have that big matchup against Texas Tech at the Garden. And he simply said, you know, no, because we have, we've had so much time off, they're just excited to be able to play. But when you look at that game coming up, Texas Tech 10-0, and, and they have been really good this season, only averaging 51.6 points per game. And that's where they, you know, hold their hat, was on the defensive end of the floor against a great offensive team like this. I'm sure Chris Beard's group, is sitting back chomping, chomping at the bit to get a hold of the, of, the, of the Blue Devils and especially being able to play at the Garden. Now their best win so far coming against Nebraska, one of nine undefeated teams left. Texas Tech sees Duke on Thursday. Another undefeated team, Buffalo. See them coming up next here on ESPN2 from the Carrier Dome in Central New York against Syracuse. Freiburg misses the three. Looking inside for Bolden, but the zone has collapsed against him. O'Connell from deep. Got it. And it's 24-18. Duke trailing most of the first half, now leads by six. And prior to the game, Coach K had nothing but praise about Alex O'Connell and how he was coming on strong and finding a way to get minutes on this team, and he's showing it to us with his three-point practice. West Zion Williamson after getting an elbow to the mouth is back onto the floor you tell he's not a hundred percent comfortable yet how could anybody be Ooh. after you see that 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 blow it's gonna be a while before it's a hundred percent comfortable once again but this guy's so tough he's gonna go out there fight through that it probably won't phase him probably just made him a little bit mad Slow start for Duke now as they've got the lead, still shooting under 30%, and Princeton has gone cold. But what Duke has done, they've cleaned up on the defensive, uh, defensive end where Princeton was getting all the backdoor cuts that allowed them to open up the offense. Duke has done a great job of the last few possessions cleaning that up, and speaking of great job, <laughs> wow. that's just a great job of being an athlete. Zion Williamson, through the contact, is able to still have the concentration to finish with the lob, not the traditional lob, and you see Morales come in and really get underneath them. And that's a great call right there by Ted Valentine along the baseline. What could be considered incidental contact, but that's something that could, you know, basically lead to an injury if Zion comes down over the top of him. So I like that call, making sure that they're on top of that, protecting the players in the air. It was 18-16 in favor of Princeton. 
And as the story has so often gone this year, Duke goes on a run 11 straight to take the 27-18 lead. You know, for as long as I've watched Duke basketball, which dates back probably to the early 80s, when Johnny Dawkins and Jay Billis were getting it done here at Cameron Indoor, anytime you watch Duke play, especially at home, you have to be prepared for that run. At some point, there's going to be a run throughout that game. That run could be six points, which separates them, or it could be 40 points, is what we saw against Stetson a couple weeks ago, where it pretty much, you know, eclipses a team and takes them completely out of the game. Now you mentioned that era of Duke basketball. Dawkins, Billis, Allery, Henderson. Four freshman starters. Only the third season Coach K has done that. This year, last year, and that 82-83 season. Blue Devils are 9-1, and one, running away at the moment in the first half. Except Hold on, you're not first, you're last. Is Jay actually in studio quoting Ricky Bobby? Is that what is going <laughs> on right now? Is that what we've come to, Jay? You're quoting Ricky Bobby on studio. Okay. You're not first, you're last. For the record, Ricky Bobby's dad was drunk when he said that. Back to live action here in Cameron Andorra <laughs> Stadium. Mike Cousins, Corey Alexander, maybe ejecting from this seat at halftime. Who knows? 27-18. <laughs> hey, Ricky Bobby's dad admitted in the movie that he was drunk when he told him that. That's just a fact. Well, Princeton had been scoreless over its last four minutes and had gone seven straight possessions without a bucket. Gets a much-needed three there to make it a six-point game once again. And still in the zone, and now Duke finding a way to get the ball inside the paint against the zone defense. Princeton going to stay in that zone with Llewellyn on the floor in order to keep him out of foul trouble. But Coach K talked to us about the fact that he has a number of players who are really good in the middle of the zone. But the problem is getting the ball inside there to those guys, R.J. Barrett, Zion Williamson, allowing them to be able to operate inside the paint. So far, an entirely Llewellyn-based possession. And he puts too much on it off the window scurrying to get back to the top of the zone but it shows you his value on this team and you know why he's been so successful in just the two games that he's played thus far because he's able to handle that pressure on the outside just like rj baird air baird is able to be successful when he touches the paint loved hearing mitch henderson talk about llewellyn how confident he is not only as a player but as a student as well somebody who's curious about what's going on around him and very much a princeton guy you know one of the things they bonded over during his recruitment? Harry Potter. Loves the Harry Potter books so much so that he's got a tattoo of the Deathly Hollows on his arm. The Elder Wand, the Stone, the Invisibility Cloak. He said his favorite book is The Order of the Phoenix. The most descriptive one, he said. He really felt like he was there at Hogwarts. And, and what was cool about being at an Ivy League school, he says, they've actually got a hall on campus that looks like the Great Hall, Proctor Hall at Princeton, kind of resembles the Great Hall, the Dining Hall at Hogwarts. Well, he said that Princeton's campus reminds him of Hogwarts, which was one of the reasons why he chose Princeton, <laughs> believe it or not, but that shows Hopefully you. further down on the list than like academics. Hey, it. it was one of the reasons. I didn't say the main reason, just one, <laughs> but that really shows you where we are. You talk about RJ and Zion as possibly the, art, the odd couple with Felix and Oscar. We're talking about movies in this game, and I'm talking about Talladega Knights, The Legend of Ricky Bobby, and you're talking about Harry Potter. It doesn't get much different than that. It's true. You got to have a creative mind to enjoy all of those things. There you go. 33-23, Duke out in front, looking to extend its non-conference home winning streak to 146 straight, and it gets a lot easier when they can score like that. But you see what happens when Princeton goes back to the man-to-man -man defense. You give Zion Williamson an opportunity to be able to attack against one individual in comparison to the zone where you have multiple players guarding an area. Stevens, their second leading score at 13 a game. Just seven to shoot on the kick out for DeRozier. Now Kennedy, a great three-point shooter, has his shot altered by Barrett. Excellent defensive possession from Duke. Now in all of the categories that you expect from Duke is Cam Reddish knocks down another big three at the top of the key, which is the reason why earlier was the bad shot. He was just getting his, getting his shot together. But one of the stats, you know so much about this Duke team, but 
many people probably wouldn't recognize that they actually lead the country in block shots at seven and a half block shots per game. And you think about Duke and the offensive juggernaut that they are, but they really have become a very good defensive team this year. They've already in four games blocked at least 10 shots. It's a pretty remarkable stat. Ted Valentine stops the clock at 29.4. The foul under the basket on Ariri Guzzo, the big man's second. And you see another attack to the rim by Zion Williamson going to his right. But that's one of the things when you, when you have guys like R.J. Barrett, Zion Williamson on those wings, when they see one individual trying to guard them, they're going to attack. But against the zone, when you see possible, you know, the secondary defenders right there back behind them, it oftentimes can discourage you from going to the basket. But you see Zion on the previous possession where he's able to get there and almost like a fullback covers the basketball up, using that strong upper body to be able to finish on the other side of the rim and then getting to the free throw line on this possession. But when you play this team man to man, it's hard to keep those guys out of the paint. Zion went one for two at the stripe. And Delorier is in to replace him defensively for the final shot. If there is one thing to nitpick about right now with the Blue Devils, free throw shooting could be at the top of the list. You know, and, and when you look at Zion and RJ, who are going to get to the line a lot, they both, neither of them have been good shooting 63% and 66% respectively. I think that those numbers will go up throughout the season because they are both very good at the free throw line. It's just different when you're, you know, playing at a different level. The game slows down, and you take advantage of those opportunities the more you play. Reddish right now is the only starter above 70% at 77%. Foul there on Jones. He sits. And it's 12 seconds for Princeton's last look of the half. In the half, Duke has only led for five and a half minutes. But an 11-0 run helped them open up the score and turn a deficit into a lead. Which so far this season, they've rarely relinquished. Duke not close to the bonus, so Coach K really taking away the opportunity for Princeton to be able to run anything by getting it down now to 4.3 seconds. Changing, putting in actually Jordan Goldwire for Trey Jones, taking him out of the game. Trey took one of those fouls earlier. But in order to be able to limit Princeton from running anything that they want, they could foul again right here. Last shot of the half is a back iron three for Llewellyn. And although the Blue Devils trailed for a majority of the first 20 minutes, they lead at the break, going on a 34-13 run. It's time to send it to the studio. Our halftime report, Kevin Connors, Jay Williams, and Seth Greenberg. I like that. And will be called upon this season all year long for Duke to be that guy that stretches the floor for them and keeps that pressure off of R.J. Barrett and Zion Williamson be able to try get into that paint. They love to see Reddish getting his stroke back after going just one for 14 from three over the last two games. And as you mentioned, Barrett leading the score with 13 points, the only player to surpass 10 on either team in the first half. But the thing that you'll look at and where R.J. Bear will always be judged this season, and again, not something that I care a lot about, of course, but 14 field goal attempts for 13 points, and his, as you analytics people would like to talk about, efficiency not so great in the first half. We all use numbers, it's just how we use them. <laughs> Barrett getting two of his own to get up to 15. See, now it's even. 15 shot attempts, 15 points. You like that better than having more, <laughs> than more field goal attempts than you have points. I take it you're not a student of Bill James. <laughs> Who? <laughs> Speaks for itself. Stevens drives and gets the two back. He's got 11, leading scorer for the Tigers, the senior out of Lawrenceville, New Jersey. It's a team that certainly hopes to contend in the Ivy League this year. Didn't make the postseason field in the Ivy League tournament last year. Going 13 and 16, a tough season for the Tigers. Picked preseason fourth in the Ancient Eight this year. And that has to feel good for Trey Jones. You talk about that long layover, knocking down his first shot of the game. It was over four in the first half. They're getting that three to go, and that really opened things up. Regardless of what type of player you are, and Trey Jones is one of the most selfless players. In the, in the country, doesn't care about stats at all, but when you know you haven't made a shot, 
that's one of those things that kind of weighs on your mind, especially if you go into halftime not having made one. You know you want to see that basketball go through the hoop sometime early in the second half. I just saw this great post-game comment from Matt Painter uh, after their game over the weekend, talking about guys who are worried about how many points they're scoring. And once you can break out of that mold, how much of a better teammate you become. And certainly, Coach K feels he's a great teammate. It's just robbery from Reddish, and Barrett flies down the floor to jam it home. and pulls it back out. Crowd wants the three. Reddish gives them what they want off front iron. And Cam hesitated. That's one where as soon as he catches that pass, he should have let that one fly off of a momentum opportunity in transition. And he's got the green light to shoot that shot. Don't like to see him hesitate on that one. Those block shots from Duke really come in flurries sometimes. Fourth highest block shot rate in the country. 17% of the opposition's possessions. They got five of them tonight. Now I have a question for you. We saw a live action. Who got the block? <laughs> Delorier was Williamson in there? They, well, they both were in there. I'm not sure who got the block. It should be like sacks. You should be able to get a half a block. Oh, I like your point. Well, let's see. Who got it? Well, oh, there's no question about okay. that one. <laughs> Zion got the block. And Cam, you can't even call that a steal. That's a takeaway. The kick ahead to R.J. Barrett, who's able to finish on the break. Stadium tonight to see Duke and Princeton. My cousin's Corey Alexander, so glad you're with us tonight. And another top 25 team coming up next here on ESPN2 as well as Buffalo travels to Syracuse to take on the Orange and try and hand them their second straight defeat. Bolden turns away a Riri Guzzo there. Marquise Bolden, Marquise Bolden averaging two blocks per game for Duke. And we talked about them leading the country in block shots. And when you have a big that can compete on the interior, which they were going to, they're really going to need that as they get into ACC play and having to play against much bigger competition and no one from Princeton recognizing that the shot clock was low on that possession. Throwing it in casually, just hearing the shot clock buzzer go off. The facial expression there for Mitch Henderson kind of says it all. Williamson, his second three-point attempt of the game and just his third made three of the year. He had been stuck on two for a very long time. I can remember seeing him make one in Maui. I believe he made one against Kentucky early in the year, but he had been stuck on two for a very long time. So I know he's happy to see that one go through from beyond the arc. And then when you've got to sit for 10 days, there's nothing that number can do but stagnate. Llewellyn, the freshman in just his third game, shows his scoring prowess there. He's got seven. Yeah, love Jaden Llewellyn. They considered a four-star recruit as Cam knocks down another one. Jalen Llewellyn considered a four-star recruit coming in this year. Coach Henderson said the biggest recruiting win for Princeton. I believe he was talking about overall. But maybe Bill Bradley could have been a little bit bigger win. But yeah, maybe there's, they some didn't have that. there's some <laughs> historical context needed for that as well. Reddish tries to jam it. Williamson looks to do the same, and he gets hit on the way up. It's Zion going to the free throw line when we come back. Dukes. On a heck of a run right now. They were down 18-16. They lead by 24. So it's the beginning of the race. It's a long race. You know, five guys playing as one. What we've said about being a fist all the time. And for me, I like to believe in destinations. So we're starting a journey. Where do we want to end? You know, we want to end in April and we want to be on a stage, and we want to be accepting a national championship trophy. Earn everything, the exclusive inside look at Duke's lead up to the start of this season. You can do it by starting your free trial of ESPN Plus today. You know what else you've got to earn from Coach K? Your holiday gift. Saw some staffers around the program. 
He gave them Lou Malnati's pizza from Chicago. Okay, but if you have to earn it, yeah, is it actually well, a gift? <laughs> I mean, think so, about that. Some people are on the nice list. Some <laughs> people are on the naughty list. I don't know anyone who got Coles. Okay. But other people got Lou Malnati's pizza from his home in Chicago. Okay. His original home in Chicago. You know what I, I like best about the earn everything promo we just showed? Handwritten practice schedule. You don't see that much anymore. It's like oh. a handwritten note. It's gone by the wayside. There you go. My cousins, Corey Alexander, with you here from Durham, North Carolina. Duke 56, Princeton 30. The number two Blue Devils looking to go to 10 and 1 before they've got a top 25 showdown Thursday night in New York City against Texas Tech. Miles Stevens steps out, hits the uncontested three. And Stevens got off to a great start in this game had a big first half nine points for him but what princeton really has been missing as rj barrett hasn't missed much if anything here in this second half princeton has been missing the the production from devin kennedy their leading scorer averaging over 20 a game as rj barrett goes in using the off hand which is the right hand to finish at the rim through contact and which was not a great sh shooting half for barrett in the first half he's really gotten off to a great start in the second half Kennedy, the leading scorer coming in, only has five points, averaging 21 a night. You know, and, and that matchup has been Cam Reddish. We talked earlier about how R.J. Barrett was having to actually guard Morales, a point guard, and now it's R.J. Barrett guarding Kennedy, but they've switched on and off. But give Duke's wings credit for what they've been able to do defensively against Kennedy. Don't forget about Jack White in that equation as well. You talked about a guy who at least externally has been the biggest surprise for this team. Coach K gave him a lot of credit in that win against Yale for shutting down one of the better players in the Ivy League, Mie Oni. And here's White with the ball over midcourt. Well, I think that's what makes this Duke team different than the teams that we've seen over the past few years in which, you know, and I, I, I'd use my hands using the air quotes and say the one-and-done era for the Blue Devils as number five on the roster, number one ESPN player last year, R.J. Barrett, continues to attack the paint and put points on the board and get to the free throw line you know rj came out early and was settling for three pointers i'm sure that he got a little bit of advice from his coach at halftime saying hey these guys can't stop you from getting the rim continue to stay in attack mode and he's done that here in the second half 25 for rj barrett to follow up on a 30 point performance in their last game against yale and each time down the floor, his shooting percentage continues to go up and up and up. He's going to end up looking like a very good shooting night for R.J. Barrett after a, a subpar first half. 10 for 19 for R.J. tonight. So just about near his season mark of 48% from the floor. And we were talking about Duke defensively, and we talked about the block shots. We see another one for Marquise Bolden. I believe that could be three to four for him on the night. The eighth for the team. And it's O'Connell with the three-pointer. But that defense fuels their offense. And again, they're able to get out and force teams to start their offense much further on the floor because they get out in passing lanes and deny. And you have to have guys able to make an individual play to beat someone one-on-one -on -one like Llewellyn did there for the kick to Stevens. That comes down into the hands of Kennedy as the Tigers have numbers. Llewellyn, a late contest from Williamson, can't make him pay for it. Tough night for Llewellyn from the floor. He's just three for 11 with seven points after dropping 22 on Iona on Saturday. But he's had to do a, take a lot of responsibility of ball handling against this Duke pressure defense as well, and that's something that could wear you out. And that goes back to what we were talking about with Coach K before the game is just conditioning and being out on the floor, running through drills, games every day. He had his team scrimmage, Duke did, each other on Sunday, and he said, you know, they're 18, 19 year old athletes. They thought they could do things that they couldn't do because there's no replacement for game action. Well, and, and you also add in the fact with, in Luella's case, this is only his third game. That's right. And so where, you know, Duke's freshmen have now played, this is a game 11 for them. This is only game three for Luella who missed the first seven due to injury and illness. So I'm sure conditioning can come into play for him. We mentioned Duke turning the 
defense, especially the blocks and the points on the other end, and the block by Bolden allows Jones to find Alex O'Connell in transition. And those shots are going to be very good shots for Duke this season. Those transition threes where teams are unable to match up and find guys like O'Connell, like Cam Reddish, Jack White, who are able to knock down those threes. And when they get those wide open looks, they're going to have to take advantage of them. To put the block shot number in a perspective where it really makes you raise your eyebrows a little bit, they've got eight today. And if they get two more, it'll be the fifth time in 11 games that they've blocked at least 10 shots. You have to go back the last seven seasons, 296 games. That only happened three times. 11 block shots? 10. 10? 10 or more. Wow. That's pretty impressive. I mean, especially when you think about the bigs that they've had here. And, you know, and we talked with Coach K early in this game, before the game, and he talked about, you know, everything is geared toward the pieces that you have, the talent that you have, and playing to their strengths. And you see right there, that's not a block shot, but the challenge by Jab Delaurier makes it a difficult opportunity. And again, that's where Duke is right now. He wants to play way out on the perimeter, make teams have to beat them, but, take, but protect the rim by taking charges or blocking shots. And right now, they've been a great shot blocking team. O'Connell left his feet, didn't know where he was gonna go with the ball. Stevens, leading scorer for Princeton. Has 17 and a chance to tack on with a few more. Now Princeton has gone offensively quiet here in the second half. Top scoring duo in major college hoops. Out dueling the Tigers. Eight losses this year, most recently against Old Dominion. CJ Massenburg, the pride of Dallas against Tyus Battle. Two of the top scorers there. How about this? The last time Syracuse faced a team from the state of New York that was ranked higher than them, you have to go back to January of 99. St. John's, number nine in the country at that point. Were you in school at Syracuse in 99? Uh, far from it. Far from it? <laughs> <laughs> and this is an interesting night here, too, in Cameron, where you've got no students, but a lot of other people making the trip because the student section where the Cameron crazies are normally packed shoulder to shoulder, you've got some people who are well past their student yeah, I, I was about to say, some of these <laughs> don't look like students, yet, you know, Coach K told us before the game that they get just as rowdy and there's a great energy every time they get an opportunity to do this. And it's something that, you know, he wants to make sure that these players recognize and understand that it's an event for these fans to be able to travel from as far away as they do. Javon Delaria gets in for the easy dunk off the double team by Zion Williamson, but you know, they, as far as them having to travel to get here and you know spend their harder money to be a part of this, he wants to make sure that his team comes out and plays as though they appreciate these fans showing up what they do for this team. It's a pilgrimage, though, for people who come from all across the country to watch a game here, and it's not like you know, for comparison's sake, the team we were just talking about, Syracuse, where you've got the Carrier Dome that can, you know, you think back to. Duke Syracuse games of recent years pack 35,000 into the dome. This place only seats 9,300. Yeah, it, it's, it's a hot ticket. Let's say that. And it's been a hot ticket for a very, very, very long time. So when you have the opportunity and not just to buy a ticket and get to the and be a part of the atmosphere here at Cameron Indoor, but to sit in the stands where the crazies have become so famous, you know, that has to be, you know, pretty special for these Duke fans coming in to be part of it tonight. Whoa. Llewellyn getting to the bucket. Princeton coming back here to a site they played long, long ago. You can see this on the concourse here at Cameron Indoor, which was then in 1940, the first game, Duke Indoor Stadium, which it was until 1972. When this building was built, it was the largest building for college basketball south of the Palestra in Philadelphia. And now, it's on the smaller end of college basketball venue. You know, af after seeing the 1940 picture, I'm looking, are those windows still there up top? I don't see the windows anymore. That's, the windows are gone. No, but yep. what's, what's interesting is uh, as you walk and you go through the bowels of the stadium to Coach K's office, the stadium has been added onto quite a bit. Those were the windows they're covered up. No, it definitely has been added so onto. So when you walk through the, the outer hallways, what used to be the outside of the building, the stone, 
has just been added on to, but it fits with the overall motif of the building. It does. Well, the stone now has pretty much become a museum for Duke basketball, and you see visitors in and out of here all the time. Every time I come here to do a game, during the day, you know, you see <laughs> dozens of people out there just going through the Duke basketball museum right up front of the Cameron Indoor. Williamson's got 15. After he was limited for a few minutes in the first half, took an elbow to the mouth and got fitted for a mouth brace as well. Was bleeding a little bit from the lower lip. He's Wait right back to it. Tom, did you just say a mouth brace? Mouth guard? <laughs> yeah, it, well, the mouth guard will brace his teeth. How about you know, that? That is a very intellectual way of making up for a terrible yes, mistake. It was, was a quick backtrack and a whiteout. The Warrior slams with the right hand. Transition basketball is the staple for this Duke basketball team. And I say this Duke basketball team because it changes each year with Coach K continuing to get the number one recruiting classes time and time again. This year, it's about pressure defense and transition basketball. And of course, a number of highlights when they get to the rim. R.J. Barrett, Zion Williamson, Javon Delore, no matter who it is, they have a number of guys that can get it done in transition. Duke at the half had 39. Now they're up to 75, just past the midway point of the second half. Now you can see when they go on the runs like they do, why they're fifth in the country in scoring at 93 points a game. And it sound, we sound like a broken record, but again, defense turning into offense. When you have so many players, so many athletes that can get out and make plays, and again, Zion Williamson starts on this team at the four position. Of course, it's positionless basketball, and he's not, he's not the traditional power forward. But when he gets the ball in his hands off or rebound off of a steal, he's not looking for a point guard to throw it to. He's pushing the ball, trying to make a play, and it normally comes up with points on the other end. Sports Center tonight after the Cherubundi Boca Raton Bowl on ESPN. It comes away with Kenny and John Anderson. A look at how Lamar Jackson, the new starter for Baltimore, makes the Ravens' defense better. Plus an inside look at Derrick Henry's record-breaking two-game stretch and Alabama's road to the college football playoff. Sports Center, 1030 Eastern on ESPN and the ESPN app. This positionless basketball, not unique to Duke, but what they've done offensively this year is modeled after a very successful team at the next level. It is. It, it, Coach K basically took a lot of the offensive principles of playing five out instead of four out, which we've seen now in traditional college basketball. Five out where he got from the Golden State Warriors and pulling his postman, which is often Marquise Bolden or Javon Delaurier, out of the paint and leaving that, op that paint open for opportunities for Barrett and Williamson to be able to attack. And now we've seen two straight games where Javon Delaurier has gotten the starting spot in the quote-unquote center position. As he hits the deck there in place of Marquise Bolden. Coach K told us that the Warrior has earned that spot, and that's not to take away from Bolden. Similarly to Jack White, two guys who could very easily be starters, but he moves much better than other big men on the roster. And I don't think you can call it the center position anymore. You just have to call it the, the five. five. There you go. See? <laughs> Look at you, Cuzzo. You learn it. Slowly but surely. It's a lifelong process. <laughs> if I put it in the book, you know it. See, that's the thing. Anything in the book, you're picking it up. Yeah, you know, I've always thought of myself more as an Ivy League guy. You know, the curious intellectual. I'm sorry. I, I think my, I've got static in my headphones or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what just happened right there. <laughs> it's a good thing I only applied to one college. 75-39, Duke over Princeton, 8.50 to play. The Tigers 5-4, and four, but on the upswing, getting Jalen Llewellyn healthy on the roster. He misses that three. And they settle into the half court on defense. With Jalen Llewellyn finding out now what it's like to come into a game at the top of a scouting report and the commanding the attention of the opposing teams, he's going to see that a lot more over his career at Princeton. But, you know, the first game where he really hasn't been able to have a huge impact the way that he wants to, we mentioned before, only his third game of his college career. And it's been a tough one here for him at Cameron Indoor. Foul called on Jordan Goldwire. Player who the Blue Devils hope can be a backup who plays a good chunk of minutes for them. Just got to value the ball is what Coach K said. And we saw him earlier this month on the first mod 21 minutes against Stetson. Granted, it was a game that wasn't very competitive for very long. But defensively is where Coach K is really most concerned about, about Goldwire. If he can come out 
and give a similar level of defensive pressure that Trey Jones does in, 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 in the conversation with Coach K before the game, we heard him mention Trey Jones in the same level as Bobby Hurley, Steve Wojciechowski, Chris Duhon. Point guards for Duke who not only got the job done offensively, but defensively as well. But you know who one person he did not mention? Tyus Jones. If I'm Tyus, I'm upset right now. <laughs> The stake. Coming up Thursday, the college basketball game of the night is here on ESPN2. Number 12, Texas Tech. Number 2, Duke from Madison Square Garden. First time they've met. It's on ESPN2 and everywhere you go on the ESPN app. One of the few unbeaten teams left in college basketball. The ranks of Kansas, Michigan, Nevada, see Buffalo coming up here in a little bit, Houston, Furman, and St. John's. An yeah, interesting matchup between Texas Tech and Duke coming up. And, you know, we talk about the unbeatens, and we had a conversation off air. Who will be the last unbeaten in Division I basketball? Good choice by you with Nevada. I thought Kansas might be it, but. Block number nine. Number 10 for the Blue Devils tonight. So that's the fifth time now in 11 games they've had at least 10 blocks. And you see Zion Williamson coming from the backside, but he doesn't have an opportunity <laughs> to block it because Marquise Bolden comes up with the block before Zion can get to it. Yeah, I'm sticking with Nevada as my pick to be the last unbeaten team in the country just because of the strength of that team relative to the rest of the Mountain West. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you on that one. Initially, I thought Kansas, but... And I, I felt like there was a tough game coming up as Bolden's unable to finish the alley-oop. But I thought there was a tough one coming up for Nevada, but you did tell me that they played that game already. Well, so. they just played South Dakota State and won just by four. And South Dakota State, in my, if I'm correct, have the top-scoring duo in all in of all college, of college basketball. basketball. And, and Zion and RJ are number two right, in all of college right. basketball. South Dakota State Jackrabbits, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Oh, that's a great nickname, by the way. It's a good color scheme, too. Oh, see, wait a minute. Light yeah. blue, there yellow. You Sorry, you I'm saying this to the colorblind There guy. you go, see? You, you had to go talking about my disability. <laughs> and that wasn't necessary in this conversation. Here's Bolden at the free throw line. Well, Kansas has a great game coming up, too. That is a... Bill Walton and Dave Pash special for you on Saturday as they take on Arizona State, which and also has one of the great young Canadian freshmen in college basketball, Lugan Stork. And if I remember correctly, Arizona State went to Allen Fieldhouse and, and beat won. Kansas last year. Yes. So I'm going to pick Kansas in that one. And I do like Arizona State. I think Bobby Hurley, Bobby Hurley does a great job. But that's one I'm sure Bill Self has his team you know, geared up for, but, you know, Lucas Dort, he's big time. I mean, you, he's averaging over 20 points per game, and you see the Canadian freshmen this year who are really having a true, huge impact in college basketball. Llewellyn, a guy whose name, not necessarily on the national radar just yet. Granted, he was out for the first seven games with an injury that he had in the preseason, his foot. But this is a guy who's going to be an impact player for the years to come in the Ivy League. He really is. And, of course, I got to watch Jaden Llewellyn a little bit. He played for my former teammate, Curtis Staples, for his last two years of high school after coming down from Canada. And really a spectacular player. Turned down Purdue, Virginia, Stanford, a number of high major opportunities to take his talents to Princeton, New Jersey. Because the campus... Looks like Hogwarts. <laughs> <laughs> the series he loves so much that he's got a Harry Potter tattoo on his arm. The Deathly Hallows. Harry Potter fans will know. I won't bore you again, Corey, with the details of it. It's, it's really not boring to me. My, my little brother was big into Harry Potter. Um, not boring at all. I have no knowledge, absolutely no knowledge of the Harry Potter, but when I was talking with Coach of, Henderson... Of the Harry Potter, yeah. That's yeah, Harry Potter series, <laughs> series of books. I do know that it was a series of books turned into movies. Correct. And um, a theme park. 
<laughs> I wasn't going to mention that. <laughs> but, you know, and Coach Henderson talked to us about it before the game and told us that's really where he and Jalen bonded through their recruiting was Coach Henderson had read the Harry Potter books. He was very familiar with, you know, the story of Harry Potter and everything involved in it. And it was something they talked about during recruiting. They didn't talk much basketball. He just related to them on a personal level. It was an interesting element to learn about one of the questions that Mitch Henderson asks players while he's recruiting them. What have you read? And, and I would have immediately stopped being recruited by Princeton because as you and I have talked about before, reading is not my hobby. So therefore, Coach Henderson may have come over to your house and recruited you at that point. But it probably wouldn't have been the better for Princeton's basketball program because I've seen your work on the court, my friend. And it's not good. <laughs> Somehow, I got onto the floor at the McDonald's All-America game last year, the night before the game, yeah. and promptly disgraced <laughs> basketball in the city of Atlanta. But you did bring your shoes, which was impressive that you came prepared to play. And threw them in the garbage afterwards. There's the bucket for Goldwire. Our buddy Jay Will was playing in some type of designer. Dress pants. <laughs> in some type of designer shoe that probably he ruined. But it was our colleague Billy Palladino who really stole the show. Well, and backs it out. Into the lane against White. Another rejection. Number 11 for Duke tonight. White at 6'7", 222 pounds. Has seen a huge jump in minutes this year. Almost 20 more minutes a game. His defense has been a big part of it. And you have to have that. When you play, when you have a team with so many freshmen that get minutes, and so valuable to your team. You have to have those veteran players like Marquise Bolden, like Jack White and Javon Delorier, who step in and fill roles. And of course, especially as this Duke team plays throughout the conference season and have to go into the road. These are guys that have experienced that before and really can, are probably a calming influence for Coach K, guys that he knows have been in that environment he knows he can lean on. This is something we've seen before this year. Justin Robinson hitting a three. And Justin Robinson makes the most of his minutes. When he gets opportunities, we saw him go for 12 points and 13, 13 points 13. in 12 minutes against Stetson. And he's off to a good start right now, knocking down his first three. And he will not be bashful as this game goes along over the last 440. O'Connell gets hit on his way to the basket by Ari Riguzo. And he's fouled out. So the big man's night is done. For Princeton. Similar to Jack White for Duke, Ariri Guzzo has made huge strides this year as well, averaging about 15 more minutes a game than he played last year. Learned, he said, how to work harder, how to work smarter in the offseason. He's a guy who's got an interesting background, too. He's licensed to sell insurance in the state of New Jersey. He wants to be a doctor. But his mom said, well, hey, I could use a little bit of help. And he got in. Well, hey, if you're going to be a doctor, whatever, what better business to be involved in than insurance? You're going to need it. You should know a little bit of everything. <laughs> you should know yeah. a little bit about it. He wants to be a doctor. He said, you know, my mom had to study for several months for the test. But, hey, I'm a Princeton guy. It didn't say that boastfully. Just like, hey, wasn't that hard to study for the test? And I passed. Well, he also said his mother just got her master's. And I believe another Masters a few months ago. So a, a household with continuing education for Aragusa. So, you know, he talked about how important academics were in his family and in his household, which was the primary reason why he chose Princeton. But his coaching staff, you know, raves about how much he's developed as a player and how much they feel as though he'll help them this season in Ivy League. Kennedy gets rid of it on the backdoor cut to the outside for Morales, and a three from Schwieger clangs out. Eighty-nine forty-four, Duke the advantage. Their average margin of victory this year is the best in college basketball, 27 points a game. Antonio Vrankovic out of the 403 mark. We talked about earlier here as he goes to the free throw line where Duke has had some trouble this year. Tonight, not so much. The free throw line has been great for them. 18 of 21, 86%. You know, and Mike, and I look at this team on the floor right now, you talk about White, Robertson, Goldwire, O'Connell, and Frankovich. 
I'm not so certain that this group, as a starting lineup, couldn't compete in the ACC. I think that they would be a competitive team, and this is the five reserve guys. This isn't the starters. I mean, again, you know, if you even put Marquise Bolden in this bunch, you know, you're talking about even better who comes off the bench right now. But that really shows you where this Duke team is. Their veterans are coming off the bench. They've got four spectacular freshmen. But they can compete with this group. And, and that's what makes this team so dangerous. Even though they are so top-heavy with talent with the young guys, they have a tremendous amount of depth on this team, which is necessary as the season goes along. White with the steal. He wants it all. <laughs> Tippins there for O'Connell. So it's the youngsters on the bench, the older players on the floor. You think about just Brinkovich in general, right? Number 30 in white for Duke. Who he came in with. Ingram, Kennard, Thornton, Jeter. Guys who have either left for the NBA or left for other schools. How much he's been through in a Duke uniform. Well, and you think about it. Each player from Duke on their roster right now has been involved in the number one recruiting class in the country. They've gotten it for three straight years. So, I mean, you know, every one of their guys has been involved in one of those classes. If you look at Jack White, you know, in last year's class, Alex O'Connell. But then you think about the class before, Harry Giles, Jason Tatum. You know, so that is what Duke has become accustomed to. And at this point, you know, and they continue, of course, the rich get richer. They've got three big-time recruits coming in next year so far and, and there could be more signing up as this season goes along as it goes in recent years some of the top players in the ESPN 100 because they've got options there's Freiburg for three we'll wait until the springtime to see what their recruiting looks like 237 to go Dukes in control 95 47 Jack White he can block a shot he can hit a three it's a guy they want on the floor a lot this year Hi, I just Jay, Seth, and me in the festive mood after the game, Mike. Yeah, I'm just a little bit disappointed we didn't get the sweater memo tonight. I feel like Corey probably had something in the closet. I don't, I don't have one of those. <laughs> you could have bought one. I don't have, no, <laughs> I don't have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> 220 to go as Duke is just five points shy of 100 and has brought in all the reserves now. Brennan Besser and Mike Buckmeyer onto the floor. Here's Besser for three. The Chicago native is wide left. You got a great game coming up. The battle for upstate New York from western New York, UB, and Syracuse in central New York. Nate Oates, the head coach there, in his first season after he took over for Bobby Hurley after they went to the NCAA tournament, came here very early in his head coaching tenure and took on Duke. He grew up a Syracuse fan, by the way, in Wisconsin. It was a kind of a downtime for Wisconsin basketball. But he was watching Derek Coleman and Sherman Douglas. Says he even had a Syracuse starter jacket when he was growing up. Two points there. What do you know about starter jackets? One. And wait, I did that game with Coach Oates bought Buffalo here for this game. It was a game scheduled by Bobby Hurley. Of course, Bobby Hurley goes to Arizona State. And Coach Oates brings his team here and the opportunity, you know, for his wife who was recovering from her battle with cancer. Crystal, she's in remission at the time. Was in, and, and so he was basically getting good news coming into this into this arena and a good showing by Buffalo when they got here. But of course, they've improved significantly since then. And now you're talking about a ranked team. Amazing that there's a ranked team in upstate New York and it's not the Cuse. And Buffalo had never been in the AP top 25 before this season. Last time at Syracuse faced a team from New York ranked higher than them in the AP poll was St. John's in January of 99. No, are you ready for me to tell America the mean look you gave me today? When Coach Henderson asked, asked me earlier who was my head coach in college, and I said Jeff Jones, who currently coaches the Old Dominion, Old Dominion Monarchs. University Monarchs. <laughs> who currently got, I mean, who recently went to the Carrier Dome and got a win, and you gave me the most hateful stare as if I played in that game. <laughs>
you claim the state of Virginia as your own. So you're, it is. you are associated with the old Dominion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I, I never root against ACC teams. Let's start with that. However, I wasn't upset about Jeff Jones and Brian Smith, my former teammate. And a former, former Virginia Cavalier on the floor as well. Yeah. Oh, BJ. Yeah. Yeah, BJ Smith. Brian Smith. Wasn't upset about it, you know, but I don't root against my league. Just 1.05 to go. Duke with a win, number two in the country. Will improve to 10 and 1. The Tigers with the loss will fall to 5 and 5. A valiant effort in the first half. The second, however, a much different story. Robinson going full steam ahead. Now Princeton on the break. It's another block. Brekovic turns it away. The Blue Devils have been a block machine today. 13 for the team. Concerns about the 10-day layoff between games may have been there over the first 20 minutes, but for these last 20, can't really say much at all. Now the difficult part comes in the 48-hour turnaround to take on arguably the best defensive team in college basketball, Texas Tech, number 12 in the country, Thursday night at the Garden. Well, this second half definitely gave Duke something to build on and an opportunity also for Coach K to rest his starters to prepare them for that game as you talked about. And it's going to be a battle at the Garden on Thursday night. Duke's got its third highest scoring total of the season. They dropped 118 in the opener against Kentucky, 113 against Stetson 17 days ago. And today they take care of Princeton 101 to 50. Impressive win, and we'll see number two versus number 12 Thursday night. That's going to be two great defensive teams at the Garden. A very businesslike effort from Duke coming in, taking care of business, moving on to the next one. But the next one's going to be interesting. So 101-50 is your final score on behalf of our entire crew. My partner, Corey Alexander. I'm Mike Cousins. Buffalo and Syracuse comes your way next. But first, we send it back to the studio and Kevin Connors and his sweater brigade. <laughs>